Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the AFO's Cafe. I'm Valentina Ferretti, and these are informal science conversations about all things birds. And for those of you who don't know AFO, because these events are open to the public, uh, you should know that AFO is a member-based organization, and we focus on the study and conservation of birds and their natural habitats. And we view ourselves as the bridge between professional and amateur ornithologists with a strong focus on Latin America. And this year is our 100th anniversary, and uh, we're going to have our meeting in Plymouth, Massachusetts on the 10th. So we're getting ready uh, for that. And I just want to note uh, for those of you who have registered to the meeting that we still have some openings for the workshops. We have an interesting workshop on introduction to passering banding on Sunday, October the 9th and Monday, October the 10th. And uh, there are, I think um, we have three more um, places on this workshop and then there's an educational outreach for field ornithologists workshop on Friday, October the 14th, and we still have room on that workshop as well. So you can just go into C event and you find that information on the AFO website and then register for the workshops if you're interested in, in um, taking any one of those. And during our conference, we're going to have actually our first live AFO Cafe, and we're going to have that at the Mayflower Brewing Company on Wednesday, October the 12th, and it's going to be from 8.30 to 10 p.m. And uh, Dan Ardia is going to be talking about birds and art. So it uh, promises to be a, an interesting AFO Cafe. Our AFO cafes are sponsored by Avinet Research Supplies. And if you need any uh, field equipment, mist nets, uh, pistolas, uh, bands, or pliers, you can just go to avinet.com uh, and purchase all the field equipment that you need there. And if you enjoy our AFO cafe and you're not a member, you can become a member today and support the continuation of these events. And now I'm just going to introduce Paulo, Dr. Paulo Jambias from Argentina. Um, Paulo did his uh, uh, bachelor degree at the University of Buenos Aires and then moved to the States and got his master's and PhD at Cornell University working on always on um, mating systems in swallows and then uh, house runs. And then he uh, got back to Argentina, to Mendoza, and now he's a researcher at Yadisa, a Conisat Institute in Argentina. And he's been working on grass runs there and has a large research group. And we're hoping to hear from um, their findings today. So what I'm going to ask everyone is to turn off your cameras and your microphones and Paulo is going to be talking and giving his presentation. And at the end, we can turn on our cameras and microphones and have a conversation um, where you can post your questions on the chat or you can just raise your hands at the end and we'll answer uh, your questions. Okay, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen and Paulo, you can uh, start sharing. We can't hear you. Uh, you're still mute. Oh, there. Let's see. No. Are you here now? Yes. Yeah, that's perfect, actually. Vale, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK. Perfect. It might have been the microphone of, of the other stuff. Cool. OK, so I'm going to share the presentation. 
Can you see the presentation? Yes. All right. So uh, thank you, Vale, and thank you for uh, to the Association of Philodontologists to inviting us to present our results today. Um, I'm very happy to be here right now and kind of shocked to see so many friends and also so many mentors. I, I, I never thought about that I will be talking to people who have inspired my work and people who have been uh, mentors to me. So um, I'm going to try to present the result of the research we have been carrying out in grassroots. Uh, this is going to be a brief summary because uh, the, we have covered so many topics and it's been very hard to put together a presentation that is fair to all the project. Uh, but at the end of the talk, we can talk more in deep uh, about different projects. Do you see like uh, something in the middle of the presentation that is no, your slides look great. We can see it clear. Okay. No, no, okay. I have some issues here. All right, so I'm going to present the work that is a result of collaborative research uh, between several researchers, grad students, undergrad students, and technicians. Uh, we have all been working together since 2010 in, in a project of uh, the behavioral ecology of graph friends. And these um, have required also a lot of help of field workers who have helped us in the field. And it's been a lot of effort because breeding seasons have uh, been particularly long and uh, grass friends sometimes are not so easy to work as we would like to. So, uh, it's been a lot of effort and a lot of people who have helped us uh, to get the data I'm going to be presenting today. So I'm going to start talking about grass friends, which uh, have recently been split uh, from the cetrans. In, when I started this project, there was only one species called the cetran from with distribution from Tierra del Fuego. Uh, to North America, but in the later year, they have been split into grass friends uh, that are the scientific name is Histotaurus platensis. So grass friends have a distribution from Tierra del Fuego to Central America, and they inhabit a different kind of grasslands along the range that they include uh, salt marshes, uh, meadow, wetlands, and dry grasslands. We have studied um, grass friends in Mendoza province, Argentina, that's South Temperate Argentina. And we have studied the population along uh, the Arroyos Pajata, and, uh, the Rio Mendoza, where we have set uh, free study plots, which they have been studied uh, in different intensity for different years. So the study site is composed mainly of grasslands. The predominant grass here is the pampa grass. Uh, winter conditions are cold. So we get some frost, but there's not enough accumulation of snow. So the environment in the winter allows the birds uh, to survive the winter year round. So in our population, uh, grasslands are uh, resident. Uh, we have some dry parts of the grasslands composed of cortaderas or pampa grasses, and also some channels and little ponds where uh, the rains breed. So to study the life of grass friends, we do uh, typical field work. Uh, we've been studying them for nine breeding seasons. Uh, we stopped working on them in 2018, but this year we are going back to the field with new projects. So the, the field season or the breeding season starts in October and it ends by the end of February. That's the summer uh, in the South in South America. And we uh, use um, the typical standard field methods. We capture the males and the females with mist nets, we put color bands. 
uh, they map their territories, um, follow them in the whole breeding season uh, to see the association between the males and the female. We search uh, for their nest and monitor their breeding success. And we use uh, micro, micro cameras to, to film their activities. So I'm glad to say that many of these free techniques I have learned with people who are right here. Uh, Tom Martin is one of them who taught me many of these uh, free techniques to, to work with birds. So when I started working on grass friends, there was no basic information. We just didn't know much about the life of this bird. So in the first year, we were uh, spent a lot of time trying to describe them they are bringing biology. Uh, now we know that uh, grass friends at our study site, they are sedentary, they, remain, they stay in the territories both the summer and the winter. Uh, they're mostly social monogamous, that's a male and a female, have an association between the breeding season and the non breeding season. Um, they have biparental care, the male and the female cooperate in building the nest and feeding the nestlings. But only the female incubate the eggs and for the next thing, she's the only one have a group patch. And only the male have complex songs and she defend the territories. They build multiple nests. That means that they build several nests that they are not uh, used for breeding. I want to go back to that later. Uh, the most frequent clutch size is between four and five eggs. And the incubation period is between 14 and 18 days, which I found a little long incubation period for a grassland bird. They stay a lot incubating the eggs. And a nesting period that is also particularly long for a grassland bird between 12 and 19 days. So the incubation period and the nesting period adds a lot of days that will expose the nest to, to predation for, for long periods, which I found particularly surprising. So I want to start from uh, the early stages of breeding, that is nest building. Uh, the first question we ask is why they build so many nests that they are not used for breeding. Uh, building a nest, especially a dome nest like the ones that restaurants uh, use, takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. There's a lot of trips that are made to the nest with materials. However, when you uh, start searching, you will find three types of nests, what we call platform nests that are a loose association of grasses with the shape of a platform. Those are around 19% of the nest. Uh, dummy nests that are dome nests, very similar to green nests, but they never contain any eggs. And the brain nest that is uh, a dome nest where you observe eggs uh, and where the brain takes place. So at the beginning, we wanted to know why they were wasting so much energy in building these types of non-brain nests. So there are several hypotheses about the benefits of building multiple nests. Nests can be used for roosting, also, Birds may use uh, non breeding nests uh, in order to dilute the probability of predation. That means that a territory that contains several non breeding nests will be a safer place to breed, mainly because uh, it will be harder for the predators to find an egg, a nest with eggs when there are so many empty nests in the territory. So we carry out an experiment uh, in several breeding seasons where. Here you can see the territories of the wrens, and you can see in this cartoon several multiple nests. So in 25 experimental territories, we removed all the non breeding nests and we only left the breeding nest. And we compare the breeding success of uh, experimental territories and controlled territories. And we didn't find any, any effect on breeding success. There are daily survival rates, predation rates, um, Cover parasitism were similar in the experimental plots and uh, in control plots. So we couldn't find at, with this experiment any advantage of bringing multiple nests. Actually, we did find a cost of building multiple nests. 
Here you can see uh, territories with different number of non breeding nests, up to 10 nests in these territories, and only one nest in these territories. And you can see that uh, in this in this in this graph that females in territories where more numbering nests were built we start laying their eggs later in the season so it seems that the more numbering nests that you build in a territory the later you start breeding which makes sense right because they build a numbering nest they abandon it then they build another one till they start breeding so the more numbering nests you build the later you start breeding now the later you start breeding also seems to affect hatching success. If you look here in this graph, uh, you can see that the more, the more numbering nests in a territory, the lower hatching success. So it seems to be that there is a cost uh, in building uh, multiple nests rather than a benefit of building multiple nests. So then uh, we thought that maybe uh, these multiple nests, the platform nests and the dummy nests were not really true categories of nests. They were just nests that were abandoned during the building process. In the sense, we expect uh, that a platform nest was a nest that was abandoned early in the breeding season. A dummy nest was a nest that was abandoned in, when it's not finished. And a breeding nest was a complete nest. So we use cameras and field observations to look at nest ontogeny. And what we have seen is that uh, all nests, all bring nests are started as platforms. And after the rains build a platform, they will build the structural layer. Uh, that is this outer layer that you can see in the dome. After that, they will add a lining layer, that's a thin material inside the nest. And then they will add a nest cap layer. So then we decide to look at the structure of dummy nests and uh, breeding nests. We're testing the hypothesis that dummy nests will be incomplete nests and breeding nests will be complete nests. When we look at the structure of the nest, we find that dummy nests, all of them have a structural layer, some of them have a lining layer, and few nests have a cup layer, while breeding nests have structural layer, binding layer, and several, most of them have a nest cap layer. So it seems like dummy nests are bring nests that are incomplete. So why deserted nests? Why, why these nests have been deserted? There are several hypotheses that have, can explain why deserted nests. Uh, we test several of them here. I want to just show you the positive results. In, this is the Cortadera where the nests are built. And imagine that a bird can build a nest around this cortadera. They normally don't build a nest in the center, but just on, on sides. So a nest can have a different orientation in relation to the substrate. And you see in this graph, most of the ring nests were built in the side of the cortadera that was facing the north northeast. In South America, the north northeast is where the sun hits early in the morning. Remember that this is a semi-desert environment uh, with riparian grasslands. So the mornings can be particularly cold. So it seems like friends are orienting their nests in a way uh, that they receive the morning sun early in the morning. Now, when you look at platform nests and dummy nests, they didn't have a preferred orientation. So it's possible that the wrens are abandoned the nest just because they are in the wrong side of the cortadera. Uh, this seems to be an explanation of why the nest might be deserted, but we are still not fully convinced we have resolved the problem, mainly because there's still some nests that were in the right place and they were abandoned. And also it's not clear why a bird had to build a nest uh, to later decide that it's just built in the wrong place. However, there is evidence in other species uh, of birds that nests can be deserted if they are not well insulated or if uh, there are not enough uh, vegetation cover. We also studied the incubation behavior of friends 
Silvina Sorochis was an undergrad in our lab. She did a honors thesis. Uh, we use micro cameras to uh, film nests during the early morning, as soon as the sun, after sunrise, and we film them for four hours. And we also use data loggers to monitor the ambient temperature at the study site. Uh, most of the time, Sylvie was just watching on cameras and this that looks like this was very boring. Sometimes she can get glimpses of the rain inside uh, the nest. Fortunately, she can go fast forward and look at the incubation behavior. Now, house, uh, house and cetrins are intermittent incubators. So like many birds, uh, many passerines that where only one adult incubates, they have on boats and off boats. The on boat is the time inside the nest. The off boat is the time the rent spend outside the nest. So they go to on boat and off boat for the incubation stage. Uh, and if you add all your on boats uh, over the time you have been uh, monitoring the nest, you get what's called the nest attentiveness. That's the proportion of time that the nest have been in incubation. And normally it's used as a measure of incubation effort. The more nest attentiveness, the more incubation effort a bird is doing. So with Sylvie, uh, we look at the uh, effects of ambient temperature on nest attentiveness. Here, each point represents the maximum ambient temperature that was recorded during the video session. That means that if we record an ambient temperature of 20 degrees, the maximum, then the worst. All the temperatures recorded were lower than the maximum. Uh, you will notice that a lot of the temperatures recorded on the video sessions were below the physiological zero of the bird. So we have to do some effort to incubate the eggs. And what's interesting here is that uh, the colder it gets, the more effort the rains do to incubate the eggs. Um, think about that at this point, when it gets really cold, the wrens are facing a trade-off between leaving the nest to forage or providing heat to the nest, uh, to the eggs. Uh, the way they do this is they produce longer on boats and shorter off boats. So mainly what wrens are doing is when it gets colder, they're putting effort in keeping uh, their eggs warm and they might be even um, uh, somehow um, sacrificing their own uh, well-being uh, to keep those nestlings, to, to keep those eggs warm, mainly because it's cold and they, they're not spending enough time foraging. So we we'll also look at uh, brilliant behavior. We got, uh, Fabiana Mendoza, she did an anesthesis in, in our lab, and she also look at brooding behavior. That's the behavior of the female to keep the nestling warm. Uh, as I told you, the female is the only one who have a brood patch and she can keep the nestlings warm. Um, also, we film the nest early in the morning and we have uh, records of the ambient temperature in the study site. Uh, again, during early stage of nestling, when they cannot uh, thermoregulate, what the females do, they have on boats separate by off boats. So they have some intermittent brooding. The main difference now is that the female leave the nest not only to forage, but also uh, to bring food to the nestlings. And also the males will bring food to the nestlings during the stage. They have a nest attentiveness of 55%, but it's not so far from the incubation stage that we have seen. Uh, and that's typical of uh, uh, passerines when the nestings are very small, like these ones that they are two to three days old. Here you can see that as the nestlings develop uh, from two to three days old to seven to eight days old and to 11 days old, they start uh, developing their feathers and they start thermoregulating. So females decrease uh, their brewing effort. So when by day seven and eight, putting effort is uh, not very high, and they still do some putting effort even when the things are older. Now, 
when we look at the relation between the mean and the temperature uh, nest attentiveness, we see a similar pattern as we have seen in incubation. When it gets colder, the females are staying longer uh, in the nest, in their nesting room, both when they are young, when their pin fells are broken, and even when they are older. So again, it seems like females are investing a lot of their, their nestlings and not leaving the nest so frequently when it gets cold, even if they should go out of the nest to forage and uh, keep their own survival. Uh, the main difference with the incubation behavior is that during brooding, uh, the male can participate not by providing heat to the nestlings, but also by um, providing food to the nestlings. So the more food they provide to the nestlings, then the female will not need to go out of the nest uh, to, to find food for those nestlings. So you look here, we have the male contribution to feed in the nestlings, the more contribution to feed the nestlings, then females can do more nest attentiveness. So it seems like both the male and the females are particularly putting a lot of effort uh, in that uh, the nestlings will get properly hit, properly brewed by the female. Milagros Jeffries has been a PhD student in my lab. She recently defended her doctoral thesis, and she was interested in brain success. And in particular, she was interested in how nest predation can affect uh, life history strategies. In particular, she was interested in, in, in studying if uh, parental activity can attract nest predators, and if that was the case, how nest predation may constrain uh, parental activity at the nest. So Millie uh, thought that it was important uh, to identify the nest predators in order to uh, try to figure out which kind of strategies they, they were using to locate the nest. Uh, so she set several cameras and tried to identify predators. Uh, she she uh, found that around 32% of the nest uh, will produce fledgings, and the major cause of failure was predation and egg extraction by cowboys. Here you can see a fox that is predating on the nest, a gray fox. And here you can see a snake that is predating on the nest with nestlings. So the major predators really identified were foxes and uh, snakes and also the effect of cover parasitism. So as I was telling you, Millie was interested in looking at how um, nest predation can increase with adult activity and if nest predation can constrain adult activity. In this graph, you can see uh, the nesting stage from building to laying incubation and nestlings. And you can see uh, the adult activity in terms of trip to the nest per hour. Uh, during building is when the nest is more active, then during laying there's very low activity, the activity increase during incubation with the onboards and offboards of the female, and they increase with nestlings as they get older, they need more food, and also um, they, 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 they keep increasing till, till they are close to fledge. However, when you look at nest, uh, daily survival rates, uh, you see that there are um, excuse me, <laughs> they, 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 they are lower even when they are uh, when, when there is uh, greater activity at the nest at the end of the of the nesting nesting period. Now Milagros also look at uh, what's going on inside each of the stages. And she found that even if you, when you look at uh, the activity at, uh, during incubation, nests that have more activity were not more predated than nests that have less activity. And during the nesting stage, uh, she found the same pattern that 
uh, birds that lay more trip to the nest to feed the nest if they don't have more nest predation than birds that uh, produce, uh, that, that have less feeding trip to the nest. So in general, we thought that um, adult activity wasn't really uh, attracting nest predators. And it makes sense from what we were seeing in the field when uh, Cetrans or Mongrassians are feeding nestlings. They are pretty obvious. They make several trips, and even if you are close to the nest, they will just go to the nest. They, they seem to be afraid. So Billy figure out that then maybe uh, what's going on is that grassrens are hiding their nests very well in order to avoid predation, and that was the main strategy. So if this is a cortadera. She have a radius of five meter around the Cortadera where she makes several um, measurements of vegetation density and cover. And what she found is that when vegetation cover is more open, uh, you have a higher daily predation uh, probability. And when vegetation is more dense, uh, you have a lower daily predation probability. Uh, so that means that the, the thicker is the vegetation around the Cortadera where you build a nest, the lower are your chances of being predated. Now, when you uh, look at the nest site, that's where the nest is built, uh, she found a similar pattern. Here you have daily predation rates, and you have higher predation rates in nests that are building substrates uh, that are lower. Uh, they have a lower cover index that they're less concealed. And also the ones that are uh, closer to the edge of the vegetation. And again, uh, it seems that citrons are trying to hide their nests as much as possible, and they might be relying on concealment rather than on reducing parental effort. And again, this makes sense to what we see in the field where when you are nest searching, uh, the, the rents will be very obvious flying to the, to, the, to, the, to the grasses where they have a nest. Um, and that's very different from other grassland birds that they either walk on the ground to arrive to the nest or they will not go to the nest with food if you are in the area. Uh, once you locate the, the pampa grass where the nest is located, uh, it's very hard to find it because it's very concealed between uh, vegetation. Uh, we also were interested in the social maintenance system. Uh, people who know my work, I've been working previously on house rents in North America and South America, and I was interested in why uh, house rents were monogamous in in South America. It's a similar pattern with set trends uh, and grass trends, where grass trends are monogamous in South America and polygenies in North America. So Daniel uh, did uh, doctoral research in my lab. He did field work for four brain systems, and he was interested in the effect of the adult sex ratio on the social mating system. So the adult sex ratio refers at the proportion of males over the number of females. So when the adult sex ratio is over one, there are more males than females in the population. And when it's below one, there's more females than males in the population. And the adult sex ratio, of course, affects the availability of males. So um, Daniel was interested in seeing if Grass rents uh, will accept to be polygenous when there was no other option, when there were fewer males in the population than female. In 2017, uh, he set uh, three study plots uh, where you can see here the adult sex ratio. Rio have uh, a similar proportion of males and females. Arroyo have more females than males, and Movidas have more males than females. So, he removed a number of males um, in, in Bovidas to change the sex ratio. And then during the breeding season, he looked at the social polygen rate. That's the number of polygen males over breeding males. 
and he found polygyny that was uh, higher in Arroyo and Bovidas, where the sex ratio uh, was biased to females. So uh, with Daniel, um, Paula and Gustavo, uh, we look at what's going on uh, along the breeding seasons through this, this time period. Here you can see the adult sex ratio. And here you can see the socially, uh, social polygyny rate. And you can see again that uh, when the, poly the adult sex ratio is biased uh, to females, you have polygyny in the population. And when it gets uh, more males than females, you get monogamy. Uh, so this looks like the proximal cause of polygyny. And that and means that females were only accepted to be polygynous when there was no better option. So that means that probably polygyny have a, a high cost for females uh, that will not, well, they will only accept that cost if there was no other choice uh, in the new system. So then we look at uh, how males will distribute uh, their parental care uh, in different mating status, mainly because uh, males normally, when they're associated with more than one female, they will have a female where they help more, and a female that probably will be abandoned. So uh, we categorize the females as monogamous, and then we have polygyny females that could be either primary or secondary. Primary females were females that the day that we assess parental care, they have. Um, the older nestlings in the territory and secondary females have younger nestlings. That's because generally males will start feeding nestlings that hatch first in the territory. So if you look at uh, the male feeding visits uh, along the, the nestling period for nesting age, you can see that monogamous and primary females uh, have similar contribution of the male, but secondary females are not having much help. Uh, that's because the male is providing uh, care in the primary in the primary nest, uh, just very similar to we have seen before in households. Now, when you look at the total feeding visits, that will be how much food a nesting will receive, either because the male and the female is helping or the female is working alone. Uh, you will see that monogamous primary and secondary females uh, have the similar amount of trips to the nest. Uh, so how is this achieved? Well, the only solution to this problem is that secondary females are increasing their feeding rate. Yeah, sorry. There we go. Uh, and that's what we can see in this graph where we look at female visits. Secondary females are producing more visits to the nest than primary and monogamous. And so they are, what they're doing is they're compensating for the lack of, of male help. So females are able to compensate when the male is not helping, but for sure breed a secondary female implies that they have to work harder. Now, we also look at the effects on reproductive performance. In this graph, we have monogamous, primary and secondary females uh, be classified now in a different way. Uh, monogamous are females with only one male, and primary, primary females are females uh, that uh, start laying the eggs first, and the, the females that lay the eggs later are secondary females. Here in this graph, you can see that uh, secondary females, especially at the beginning of the season, have nestlings of lower body condition than those monogamous and primary females. So it seems that uh, at our study site being associated with a polygynous male have a cost in the terms that you have to work harder to feed the nestlings. And at the beginning of the season, uh, you have uh, nestlings that are of lower quality. So this makes sense, right, that uh, females we only accept to be polygynous if there's no other option. In particular, since that females in our population don't have a very high uh, adult survival, uh, from, we have seen from 
what we call up and survival. That's they're citing from year to year. Survival rates might be between 40 and 60 percent, depending on the year. So it might be the only chance a female have for breeding. And if there's not enough males in one breeding system, they might accept to breed polygenistic. Uh, Ramiro has been doing a he did a doctoral thesis in my lab, and he also now is doing a postdoc. And he was interested in extra pair paternity. He was uh, co advised by me, uh, Metina Maller, and he did some lab work uh, both in Metina's lab at, and also at Cornell. So we have never seen copulation between set trends. I have never seen also copulation between house trends. So I think they're particularly cryptic. So fortunately, if we take a sample, a blood sample of a male and a female and nestlings, Ramiro can do some of his magic and be able to tell how many of the nestlings in a particular nest were from extra pair fertilizations. So when we look at the number of nestlings between eight and 27% of the nestlings uh, were sired by a male, and when we look at the number of groups with sector pair paternity, around 28, around 60% of them, depending on the year, might have extra pair of them. Now, the first question Ramiro asked is where do they are looking for extra pair paternity? How far they will look, either the male or the female, to get extra pair populations? Here in this graph, you can see different radio categories. That's uh, a radius, an area around the focal nest. Uh, you can see the availability of nest. So it doesn't seem that the number of nests decrease or increase as you get farther away from the nest. There are similar amount of nests, even if you move farther from your nest. Uh, a radius that are below 80 meters, you get fewer just because the territories are not uh, small enough. But over 80 meters, it doesn't really matter how far you go, you have a similar um, availability of nests. However, when you look at the um, number of nests with mixed paternity, um, you will see that females are getting copulations or fertilizations from mainly from neighbors. Most of the uh, paternity are, are, are coming from nests that were um, close to the focal nest. So mainly this means that either female or males prefer to have fertilizations with neighbors. Now, uh, Ramiro, I wonder which was the demographic variables that might be affect um, extra pair paternity. So he looked at male brain density and female brain synchrony. Uh, if females are more synchronous, males may be displaying at the same time and females may be able to judge the quality of the males when they are more synchronous. Or also um, adult sex ratio, if there are more males than females, that might affect uh, the availability of males. Now, the only, the only variable that seems to affect um, extra pair paternity in all the radios he was analyzing was male brain density. So the more males they are in the area, the more paternity is lost in the nest. So in summary, this is telling that females uh, are getting extra pair fertilization from neighbors, and the more neighbors they are, the more fertilization they get. Now, Ramiro wonder uh, why if males will reduce their parental investment in nests where they don't have uh, nestlings that are sired by themselves. So why males will actually provide food uh, to nestlings that were sired by their neighbors? Uh, he looked at the proportion of extra pair offspring and the male provision rate, and he don't find any correlations. The males don't seem to be changing their um, provision rate in relation to, to the loss of paternity. This is another way to see it, where you see nests with no uh, extra pair offspring and with extra pair offspring, and 
may start providing at similar rates. She also did an experiment where during the fertile period of the female, but when she's incubating, she exposed uh, the male to a mount, uh, taxi amount of, uh, of a male rasprin or a control that was a sparrow. And the, the idea of this experiment is to reduce the certainty of paternity of the male in the nest. And if male were uh, concerned about losing paternity, probably they will produce they will feed less in nestlings of experimental males, but he didn't find that. He found that the uh, male provision rate was similar in both experiments and control. I, I think that what's going on here is that grassland males are trapped in a similar system as females. Uh, they either provide food to those nests or they have to desert. Um, they might not have many bring seasons to, to do that. So uh, because they cannot really distinguish between their nestlings and the extra pair nestlings, because extra pair paternity is not particularly high, and because the adult survival is not particularly high at our study site, then males will be better off if they provide food to the nestlings, even if some of them are not sired by himself. Agustin Sarko had been interested in male dispersal. He had been looking at difference in male dispersal and female dispersal between year. This is the, the proportion of individuals that will abandon their territory in a year and move to a new territory the next year. And he found that it's very variable between males and females. Sometimes more males abandon their territories than females, but what we found very curious here that in 2015, uh, most females were moving, but very few males or no males were moving. And this is the year where we have a very high polygyny rate. So that was the year that we have a very important sex bias toward females. Uh, so it seems that in 2014, the females during the numbering season were moving into territories of males while nets were staying put. So again, if you think about, it seems like um, demography is having a strong effect uh, in both the genetic mating system, uh, the social monogamous uh, system, and also on uh, this person. Uh, we have also people who have been working in communication. Uh, uh, we are interested in understanding how harassment seeing and uh, the components of sexual selection. Uh, in particular, uh, Ola Garrido is uh, right now finish up, finishing up a uh, doctoral thesis. Uh, to look at sexual selection. She is interested in trying to identify which components of songs are uh, used uh, to defend a territory or uh, to attract uh, females. Uh, for this, she has been intensively studying the singing behavior of males. She did an uh, incredible amount of work in order to uh, understand how many different songs a male would have in his repertory. And we knew from other studies that cell trends have, can have very long repertories. Here you can see what's called the accumulation uh, lines. That's the number of songs um, that you record and the number of songs that will be new when you're recording. So, at the beginning, you're recording and you're getting more and more new songs, and then you will get a plateau when you're close to the repertoire. However, uh, we don't reach a plateau, even she has recorded a very important number of songs. So it seems that men have more than 200 different songs, and that they also share between neighbors many of those songs. Now, uh, Paul and Ramiro have been looking at um, 
which components of songs seem to be preferred by females. In this graph, what they did is uh, look at paternity laws and the different, the three different characteristics of song. Song duration in seconds. So you can see here that um, paternity loss in the nest is lower when the men have uh, particularly long songs. Uh, but also they have um, less paternity loss when they have songs with a, a, a minimum frequency that's a, a low frequency. So they seem to prefer that. And also when they have a low frequency peak, that's the kind of the intensity of, of the frequency. Uh, so this might mean two things, either that males, for example, that have uh, longer songs are betting at mate guarding, or may also mean that females prefer to be mated with males with longer songs. And because of that, they're not seeking extra pair of paternity. So Paula designed an experiment where uh, he exposed uh, a male with his preferred period of his female, greater amount of a male, amount of a female, and amount of a sparrow. And each of them, she broadcast vocalizations of males, females, and sparrows. And then she record the male, the focal male, and see uh, what kind of songs they will produce. Uh, and assuming that uh, they will produce songs that are preferred by uh, females, or they will produce songs that are better uh, in defending his female from another male. Uh, Melish found that when exposed to a female, they have longer songs, and remember that also nests with longer songs have lower tapia paternity. Also, they have songs with low frequency, um, which uh, it was a similar pattern when, when we look at the extra pair paternity and as with songs with lower frequency have uh, lower paternity loss. And in a position when they were exposed to a male, uh, they produced shorter songs. Uh, this is particularly interesting. We know that some birds do that, they use short songs uh, to male male interactions and then longer songs. Uh, between male and female interactions. Natalia Garcia is uh, a researcher in my lab, and this year she will be looking at how males share their repertoire. And she's interested in trying to understand how uh, they, the, 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 the number of songs that they share can be used in nest defense. Will the males prefer to? Uh, match the, the repertoire of an ML in agonistic behaviors, or they will avoid matching. And for that, you will use some playback experiments uh, to see either if the males are using the songs that they share to solve uh, their agonistic behavior. Uh, Luciana Lopez, uh, she started her PhD this year. and. She's interested in the calls of the wrens. Uh, similar to uh, what I have seen in house wrens, such wrens have two different calls that they produce when you approach a nest, we call them A and B. And we don't have a clue of what they mean, why they have two calls, if the call is more frequent the male or the female, or if they are used in different contexts. So this year we're going to be uh, running some experiments to try to understand uh, why they produce two different calls and what they mean. Now, uh, I have tried to summarize a lot of work and hopefully I haven't been unfair to so many projects. Uh, it's, it's, it's been a challenge to, to, to move between so different topics. Uh, several of the people who have carried these projects are right here now in this cafe. Uh, so I, it would be nice also if, if you have questions of particular project, they might be also, uh, they might be um, available to answer particular questions. Uh, we have been studying plant and care intensively since that 
uh, grasslands seems to produce a lot of investment in the nestlings and in the eggs, even the conditions are challenging. Uh, it might be this because uh, winters are particularly hard, so they might be investing in those nestlings so they can survive the winter conditions or be or compete for territories. Uh, also, it seems that the grasslands are trying to uh, avoid nest predation by concealing their nests as much as possible. And it seems that parental care is not constrained uh, by the activity. When it comes to social mating systems and genetic mating systems, I have seen a very strong effect of demography where um, adult sex ratio is affecting the social mating system and uh, male density is as affecting uh, the genetic uh, mating system. Uh, the breeding success is uh, not particularly low as I have seen in other places, but not very high neither. But we've been talking with Millie a lot is what, why these birds stay so long in their nest when they can fledge uh, when they are 11 or 12 days old. One possibility is that they stay longer because uh, they are safe in the nest. As you might recall from the graph I showed from Milagros, uh, the predation rate at the end of the nesting period wasn't particularly high, so they might want to abandon the nest in better uh, development so they can fly and avoid predators outside, which there are like some species of falcons that are predated on that. Uh, when it comes to life histories, um, this bird seems to have intermediate life histories between what we call tropical birds and northern bird birds. Uh, they have appeared clutch sizes than tropical birds, but smaller clutch sizes than northern bird birds. Uh, still a lot of rural communication since that uh, grasslands have very, very complex songs that they might use for both defending the territory and the female and attracting female. Um, and it seems to be that some of those components have been uh, selected uh, by females. Well, I would like to thank many agencies and institutions that have funded this project. Since we are here, uh, the Association of Philorithology have funded several of the student projects. Um, so I will now answer some questions and would like to chat and share your opinion. Thank you. I don't know if you want to stop sharing the screen so that we can uh, yeah, see. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, everyone can turn on their cameras if you want. And um, also, you can ask questions. I think that there are some, um, there's a question on the chat, but I, I'm going to let some people uh, I'm going to give some people time so that they can write their questions. Um, and I'm going to ask you, I'm going to start by asking actually, you said that the nests are faced or most nests are faced uh, north, northeast. And I'm just wondering if, um, and you also said that early morning temperatures are low. So I'm just wondering if you measured the temperature of the nests inside the nests and uh, found a difference between those that are facing nor north, northeast, and those that are not, and a difference in attentiveness, uh, because that might be advantageous early on during incub incubation, especially early on in the morning. Absolutely, that's, that's a great question. And the answer is no, but we really want to do it. Uh, so now um, we're trying to get a PhD student uh, to study uh, the benefits of nest orientation. Um, so we want to do exactly what, what you are saying on some experiments. The cool thing about uh, restaurants that you notice the dome in our study site, you can pull it out very easily. Uh, it doesn't really break, you pull it out and you can actually move it around in the same container. So what we want to do now is first of all, work with eye buttons to, to check the differences in temperature 
in the morning between different locations in the Contadera, as you were saying. But also we want to use these micro cameras to see if, if we move the mess around, if we can find a difference in environmental effort and success. For example, will a nest that is in the southwest orientation, will the female have to do more brooding effort or more incubation effort in the morning, right? Uh, so many of, of, it's interesting because uh, for most of the projects, we have been working with, with Citrans since 2010, uh, and have opened so many questions that we need to follow up. I think this is just the basic research uh, to move into more complex question. And this will, I think in the future will allow, allow us to, to test uh, uh, with experiments, several of the hypotheses that I have been suggesting along the talk. Thank you. Um, is Fernando Gonzalez Garcia in the audience? Do you want to ask the question, um, Fernando? I can read the question, but <laughs> um, yeah, I can read. I can read the question. So it says, "What other studies are being carried out with the species, and what about dialects and individual recognition?" And he doesn't have a microphone, <laughs> so that's why he okay. <laughs> he's not so, asking the question. Directly. No, that's that's a very interesting question, and again, it's something that is in our mind. Our, our most limitation is uh, human resources. Uh, we don't have other people working in other areas. And as far as I know, nobody's working or have worked uh, in the later year with uh, uh, mushrooms in North America or in other population of grasslands in South America. However, what I have been doing in, in the last years together with Natalia uh, Garcia, uh, we have made several trips to different areas and we're building a library of songs on different areas. And we are planning to, to compare the, the dialects, um, especially because this, when you move along a transect in Argentina uh, from north to south, you move through really different subspecies of, of wrens. Um, we still don't know if there may be even different species. And it seems to me that uh, some of the calls and some of the songs of Russians in Patagonia are quite different from what we see uh, in Mendoza. And what we want to, to find is that area where they, they are changing. But so far we have been collecting data and building the library, but we haven't had time uh, to analyze uh, the songs. Uh, right now, uh, Luciana Lopez is looking at the calls. Remember those two calls I show you? Yeah. Everywhere I have been working with my friends, uh, they have those two calls, but they seem to differ a little in structure. And there are two reasons they might differ. First one is that you might recall uh, from the environments grasslands live, some of them live in areas where there is a lot of water, like uh, marshes, and other ones may live in areas where dry grasslands. And that seems may, may affect the, the structure of course uh, to, to enhance communication. But also we might have different subspecies that have been isolated for some time. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's very cool. Um, it's in our mind, but we really don't have any data yet. Juanma, you have a question. Hi, Paulo. Well, very nice talk, really interesting research. Uh, and I was wondering, comparing to my study uh, species, the, the bay wings, uh, knowing that you have uh, many banded individuals, if you were able to monitor individuals from the nesting stage to stretching and after uh, the, in the breeding attempts, if you were able to see, you know, how many breeding seasons they need to go from uh, nesting to the first breeding attempt, or you know, if they just float through the first breeding season, or they just start breeding in their first year. 
that's another area that we're very, very interested. And I have, I want to tell you what we've seen in the field. And again, it's something I want to study in the future. We need to have people to work on this. Uh, but mainly you're asking me after what happened after the, the nesting hill the nest, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is what happened. Uh, once they leave the nest, uh, because they leave the nest so late, you have seen that some of them, maybe 18, 16 days in the nest, they are fully feathered and they are really good flyers. So they stay in the territory for at least two weeks. And those during two weeks, uh, the male and the female will feed them. There's a lot of variation there. Sometimes mm -hmm. the male and the female will feed them. Sometimes the male will feed them and the female will start a second nest. After two weeks, uh, or around that time, they get what we call uh, a free pass. And that's something mm -hmm. I have also seen in house friends. They can move between territories in the area and nobody attacks them. If a male moves into a territory or a female moves into a territory, it will be immediately attacked by either the male or the female. But the juveniles, post-fledging, they can just move around in the area. I have seen the same on half friends in, in Buenos Aires. Mm -hmm. At that time, they start uh, practicing uh, their songs. They, they produce what we call the plastic song. Mm -hmm. So maybe four weeks after they fledge, they start, uh, they go outside, uh, bring areas and they hide in the vegetation and they start producing a song that is very good. That's the plastic song, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what happened next is in the next summer, so let's talk, we are talking about January, February, October, uh, those males have already a full song. They have some crystallized somewhere there and they will start singing in their first year and they establish territories. Like for aluminum banded birds, most of them will be first year birds. So they don't delay breeding at all. So the next year they have to find a territory and they start breeding. I would still have been uh, looking at uh, natal dispersal, uh, but it is, it's, you know, it's, it's very hard data to get uh, unless you have, a, a, yeah, <laughs> you have to have someone really focus on that and you don't have any, any people. I try to do it uh, with color bands, but it's very difficult. I hope in the future, this is the kind of project is in it high technology and requires a lot of effort, but sometimes the result is not as sexy and publishable, right? Yeah, uh, so yeah. it's, it's hard to, to, to get people working on that. Uh, but that's as much as we know right now of their dispersal. They don't seem to be going very far. Uh, when they disperse. And this probably have uh, an implication on how much they share their songs between territories. Because remember I told you that they start practicing their song the three weeks after fledging. So that means they have been listening and recording the song of the parents and the neighbors. And then next year they will move to another place where that song will crystal crystallize. So they will be carrying the songs that they learn there. When mm -hmm. they look at how many songs they share, they were sharing similar amount of songs all over the place. We don't find a clear pattern. Uh, it makes sense because they are moving uh, with the yeah. songs not far away, but they keep um, spreading the types of songs in the in the area. Okay, thank you. Um, it's really really interesting that they do not. Uh, to delay their breeding. I thought they, they may take a couple of breeding seasons to start breeding, but it's really interesting to hear that they they were just breeding no, almost the first time. I, I don't don't think they, they have a very long lifespan. Like you mm -hmm. may see a same bear for three or four years. Between years, normally we get like half of the birds will survive the next breeding season. So each season you have to ban around half of the population. Most of the birds in the first year, so they, they, they seem to be a little in the in the fast lane, uh, mm -hmm. with uh, no, not very high survival and trying to put as much effort in the first year event as possible. Thank you, Thank you very much, Paula. Uh, Scott, 
Johnson, you have a question. Very good, very good talk, Paolo. Um, two two questions. With these non-breeding nests, are they are they ever used in a subsequent season, or do they just fall apart and disintegrate, or do they birds sometimes fix them up and use them? Uh, yeah, we we did some. No, yeah, this is an interesting thing about the nest. So. Let's talk about the, the dummy nest, right? But the ones that they can be used, they are not maintained. And in some occasions, we have seen one or two birds that they will use one of those nests for breeding. They will start building again on that nest. But most of the time, they don't keep them and they, they start decaying. Okay. Also use uh, data loggers uh, and we set them inside the nest because we were trying to see um, if females uh, or, or males or juveniles were roosting inside those nests. And they actually, some of them are roost in those nests, but very, very few. And um, the other thing is that um, they are not kept during the numbering season. So by the end of the season, most of them have decayed. And during the numbering season, there's no bring nest. They have fall apart mainly. They don't maintain it during the numbering season. That's when it gets colder. Um, the third line of evidence is uh, when you look at other wrens in the tropics, uh, like any corina wrens, the structure of uh, roosting nests is a little different uh, from the structure of breeding nests because they have different selection pressures, right? Like a roosting nest uh, in tropical wrens, they will build it in a more exposed site so the bird inside can see. Uh, predators approaching. Uh, they also have less lining. And, and actually, when you're researching, you can tell them apart. Uh, for grass friends, uh, we don't find any differences in location when it comes to uh, vegetation structure. They were built at the same altitude, in the same cover, and with similar dimensions. The only difference we found is that they have less uh, lining material. And, they do not have uh, nest caps in general. Okay, uh, that answers that question. My, my other question was, and I saw this in house wrens, but if a, if a pair starts breeding late relative to its neighbors, there's the potential for that pair to be, and especially that female, to be surrounded by other males whose females are now incubating, no longer fertile. And so those males have time on their hands, so to speak. And we found a, a really higher rate of extra pair paternity in those late breeding pairs, I think because they had so much pressure from males coming onto the territory, trying to seek extra pair copulations and so forth. I, I wondered if you look at um, sort of a neighborhood level of breeding synchrony and whether you found um, later breeding pairs had greater um, numbers of extra pair young in the nests. I will uh, let Ramiro, who is here, answer that question because he has done so much analysis. Uh, I think he, he, he might give you a better answer than myself. Yeah, actually, I think that all your students and postdocs and researchers that did some work, they can turn their cameras on so that we can all Please. see that. I would, I would that would like be that. great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, Scott. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting interest question. Interesting question. When I was analyzing the data, I tried to figure out if there was difference uh, between <clears throat> extra pair uh, pattern, extra pair nestlings uh, between early nest and late nest in the season, and we found no difference uh, in that moment. Yeah. Uh, but I have read. Um, other articles that mention it and they, that they found. So I tried to figure out if we, we have that, uh, that result in our population, but uh, I didn't have it. We didn't found any, any yeah. So, uh, yeah. Do we have so, uh, questions on YouTube, Matt? The YouTube never worked, so. Oh, right. I, I forgot about that. <laughs> Sorry. <Right here. laughs> I didn't even know it. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm used to asking about YouTube. Um, so Tom had Tom Martin had to leave. He wants to talk to you, Paolo, next week on WhatsApp. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <That's a message. laughs> oh, oh. <Oops. laughs> I'm afraid now. <laughs> what have you been yeah. doing all this year? <laughs> um, do we have any other questions for Paulo or Ramiro or Milagros or Paula or Natalia? <laughs> no? Well, thank you then. That was great. Oh, there's Natalia. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. And um, well, I hope some of you I will be able to see at uh, the in-person AFO Cafe in, in Massachusetts. <laughs> see you. Bye. Well, thank you, Thank Paolo. you, everyone, to being at this talk. Bye-bye. Uh,